Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about schema-based API testing uh, today, and I'm going to talk about a library named Schema Thesis that uh, enables this for you. So my name is Alexander Haltner. Uh, I'm a freelance developer, and uh, I have my own company, Haltner Technologies. Uh, I'm on Twitter at, under at a Haltner. You can contact me via email or um, just go to my website. Uh, all the slides will be on slides.com slash Haltner. So if you want to see them now, you can go there or whenever you want. And uh, I, all these blue links, they, uh, they are clickable. So if you go to the slides afterwards, you can go to all the libraries I'm talking about and uh, all the links I have attached in my slides. I also have a GitHub repository with some more information. So that's good to know as well. Uh, so let's get to it. So the outline uh, for this talk is, uh, first I'm gonna have a very short introduction to API schemas for those of you who haven't used it already or aren't familiar. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the problems uh, we may encounter. I'm also gonna talk about the solution I'm proposing and I'm gonna talk about uh, property-based uh, testing in general a little bit, uh, not too deep though. And then I'm gonna go into Schema Thesis, which is the library this talk is mainly focusing on. I'm gonna demo some features from it. I'm gonna uh, show its uh, CLI interface, its PyTest integration. I'm gonna talk a little bit about stateful testing and what that means. I'm gonna talk about the future and I'm gonna have some Q&A on the end. So, that's a very short outline of what uh, we're going to talk about today. So let's continue. Uh, so API schemas, uh, a lot of you probably already heard about them, uh, but basically what they are is a specification for your API. So for instance, um, open API is probably the most uh, popular one today, which was previously known as Swagger and older versions is still called Swagger. Uh, today, Swagger is a UI for OpenAPI uh, and it's very popular for REST-based uh, uh, APIs. Microservices uses these a lot and it makes uh, it much easier to work with other developers. And I think that probably a few of you have already used it and maybe a lot of you. Uh, then there is uh, GraphQL, which is a completely different query language uh, and a data format, uh, which includes schemas from the get-go. Uh, I'm gon not going to go too deep into that, but it's something we are working on in Schema Thesis, so I'm going to mention it at least. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, so uh, API schemas for Flask then. There's lots of implementations, but there are two uh, ways of using API schemas that are very popular. Either you have the spec first, and then you generate logic from the spec that's connected with your app, or you have the code first, and you generate your specifications from the, from the code. And uh, I'm not gonna uh, be suggesting that you use one or the other, but I'm just gonna showcase a few libraries that supports this. this uh, I've mainly used Flask REST, uh, uh, REST Plus myself. It's nowadays named uh, RESTX. I use it. I use it for some of the samples here. It does use the older 2.0 version of uh, OpenAPI or Swagger. So there is some features that you can't use with, with it, but it's a very good option. I think I saw at least uh, some uh, talk using uh, REST Plus yesterday. I think it was Laura. Uh, and uh, there's Flasker, there's API spec that uses Marshmallow to generate the schemas. Uh, and all these links as well are a clickable connection. Then is uh, one from uh, Zalando where you write the spec first and generate your routes and validation from that. So let's go ahead. So what's the problem then? Well, sometimes we have inaccurate data a uh, user maybe uh, makes a request you didn't expect. You may have some mismatch between your logic and your database layer. 
uh, and you may have some defect in a library or framework even. There can be an invalid schema without you knowing it if it's a minor thing. You maybe missed some edge cases, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot of things that can go wrong even if you have a schema. It's a very good thing to have the documentation, but as we all know, the documentation is only good if it actually uh, conveys the true behavior of the application. Uh, so there's a spectrum of defects. Not all errors are equal, but they're never good to have. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few different uh, errors you can have. Maybe you have the incorrect schemas or non-conforming. Maybe this isn't a very high severity. It's not something that's going to break your entire application, but it's, it's going to be a time waste. It's going to cost money. It's going to lead to incorrect assumptions. It's going to break client generation code. It's going to be a major annoyance for anyone working with the uh, specifications. Then you have unhandled errors. These are also a bit lower on severity if they aren't causing any further problems, but they look bad. bad. It's a huge inconvenience for the users, it may cause some uh, confusion and it may even lead to further escalation. So you should, should probably handle these. And to take it one step further, you have logic errors. These can uh, lead to much worse things. So these are medium to high severity. Maybe you can get some data corruption um, and the data maybe gets more and more corrupted when it goes through your API. Maybe you load some data, a time zone for instance, you do an incorrect uh, assumption about the time zone used and then you put it back into your API and it comes out with an offset of an hour and you run it through like 100 times and it's several days wrong. I think we have seen similar problems in real applications. You can have incorrect behavior uh, or maybe crashed application if it's really bad. Or uh, for instance, if you have a shopping system or a cart, maybe you can allow for negative billing or incorrect billing. I've seen uh, e-shops allowing you to buy uh, minus uh, 10 computers and you get a negative price on your whole checkout. So that's not not great. Uh, and then you have security problems and these are high to critical. So maybe you have denial of service, making your service unavailable for users. Maybe you leak data and then the EU won't be happy with you and your users won't either. Maybe there's an authentication bypass, which is really bad, or even remote code execution, which basically lets them use your computer for whatever they want. So these things aren't great and we want to avoid them. So how can we detect them then? Of course, we can use testing. Uh, and uh, the solution I'm uh, proposing today is that we use property-based testing, uh, which is great at finding corner cases. It lets uh, your computer do most of the heavy lifting. So instead of defining every single example, it will generate lots of examples and just makes sure that they follow your rules. So Hypothesis is the de facto standard in Python for property-based testing. It's a really good uh, library. And a property is a model of the behavior of your application uh, given a certain type of input. So this is what we need to be able to use property-based testing. And the solution then, well, uh, the solution is that we need to model these properties. So the test application, we need to model uh, the behavior and uh, the input we want to use. Uh, what can we do better? So we already had, have these schemas. And the nice thing about them is that uh, with the schemas, we have a definition of our logic. We have a definition of our rule set, what we can input, what output we should get. So it does sound a bit uh, like the properties, doesn't it? Well, yes, of course. And that's why we can leverage this. Uh, and with schema thesis, we generate our properties based on these schemas. So into schema thesis. Uh, it takes over from its spiritual predecessor, Swagger Conformance, which did a similar thing, but hasn't been actively developed in the last two years. 
uh, and both are based on hypothesis uh, and are and uh, schema physics is inspired by the quick rest uh, research paper that uh, details a lot of findings and smart uh, things you can do to generate better properties. And I recommend reading it for anyone who have time over and uh, think these things are interesting. It's not too long. Um, and uh, the nice thing is that it allows us to automatically generate all the test cases based on the specs we already have. So it turns out that we already know quite a bit about our application. We know that the application should respond, the server shouldn't crash. We know that stateful links between objects should behave in expected manners. Uh, this is a new feature. Uh, we know that uh, if we create a resource, query it, update it, delete it, it should be consistent with uh, each other. So we can use this to find uh, more information, etc. cetera. Uh, and here we have a example uh, showing uh, some of the logic uh, we, we can know for any applications. We know the status code should always be under 500 if something hasn't gone wrong. We know the, uh, the status code should be in the endpoints allowed response codes. Uh, and we know that the content type should be an allowed content type for the endpoint. We know also that the content of the actual data should match the schema specified for that endpoint. So just using this, we can do a lot. Um, so I'm gonna show a quick demo. Uh, let's hope nothing breaks because demos are always a problem, but I'm praying to the gods. So uh, let me do this. So here I prepared a short example. I'm just gonna use, uh, use uh, a test application, which is the Flask uh, Restex uh, uh, example from their documentation. It's the same from, uh, from uh, REST Plus. So it's a basic to-do application uh, and we don't need to go into the code further. Uh, and let's uh, run the server. Uh, so I'm using Poetry and now I'm running it. So now let's try running uh, some tests towards it. So we have uh, a make file uh, where I have already put up some stuff. Uh, basically, we want to run schema feces um, with HTTP against the server we just set up right now. Uh, so let's try this out and let's see what happens in the log over here. Uh, so I'm running it and as you can see, it's hitting our API with a lot of stuff. And as you can see here, it's doing some tests to the different endpoints we have and it have performed the checks for all these and it's successful. And then there are, as you can see, we can also run it directly by importing the code. We have some stateful testing. I can uh, uh, run this like this and now you will see that nothing comes up in the log because it's importing code directly so I can close the server and it will still work. So this is a quick demo. Basically you can see that it's trying a lot of different things. It's using negative numbers. It's uh, basically it's using zeros. It's uh, using very big numbers. It's using small numbers. It's uh, really trying to find the stuff that's going to to break the application, it just ra randomly generates a lot of stuff. So very nice in my opinion. Uh, so as you can see, lots of random requests, random data generated for us. Uh, and uh, yeah, quite useful. So quick feature overview. Uh, there's a lot of features and more is coming. You have a CLI interface built-in whiskey support. It's the import thing you saw right now. An HTTP interface, I showcase this as well. Very quickly, it's uh, language and framework agnostics. You can use it with whatever language or service you want. You have a PyTest interface, so you can write your own properties and tests in PyTest and extend uh, that way. You have stateful testing. I will talk a little bit more about this. Fix-ups, uh, I won't go too deep into this, but it basically allows you to add some fix-ups for non-conforming uh, 
uh, implementation so you can go ahead and keep using them. For instance, FastAPI uses some features from the unreleased uh, OpenAPI 3.1 version. So there's built-in fix-ups for that. Uh, hooks, so you can uh, have a global hook, a test hook, a schema hook, and extend the behavior uh, or customize the behavior of schema faces. Targeted property-based testing. This basically basically you, uh, lets you search for a defined goal, so you can combine the randomness with more traditional search patterns, for instance, response time or something like that. You can record VCR uh, cassettes, which is great, great because if you have tooling already using VCR, you can use it with hypothesis or with schema thesis. And uh, there are some extra fields. You can replay the recorder cassettes. So let's go into the CLI interface. Uh, basically, you have most of the options very well documented under the help flag. And there's a help flag for the different uh, subcommands as well. Uh, very comprehensive, but a minimal example here we run schema thesis as an endpoint uh, on localhost, and we point it to our Swagger schema and as you can see it starts to run the tests and you get some output uh, and then we have the whiskey ascii interfaces as well to import implication applications i think it's great to use both you shouldn't rely on one on the or the other because uh, for an end-to-end -end test you want to test the entire chain maybe you have some caching you have api gateways proxies lots of things can go wrong along the way. So it's good to have it tested somewhere all the way. Uh, but you also have the Whiskey ASCII interface, which is very useful if you want to do quicker testing. It's much faster. You can use it locally or just test the uh, merge uh, request, pull requests. Uh, yeah, just to do faster tests. Here's a Whiskey example. So basically, instead of uh, adding the endpoint, uh, for uh, the URL, we instead have the import path, uh, basically the same you would use with Vanicorn or whatever, and then the endpoint for the schema on the imported one. Uh, so the HTTP interface uh, is framework and language ag agnostic, so it's uh, what you have to use if you want to use it with something else than Python or Whiskey ASCII, but it's great because you can use it with COBOL if you would have a COBOL interface with the API schema adopted, but maybe. Uh, and uh, then we have the PyTest interface. So schema thesis can be used to generate strategies for PyTest and we can define our own properties. The built-in checks is uh, not a server error, status code conformance, content type conformance, and response schema conformance, but maybe you want to extend it with say complex business rules you may have, or maybe you have a response time SLA rule you want to enforce, or maybe some special authentication uh, uh, to properties you want to make sure hold true. So that's very nice if you want to go and do those things. And uh, to use it, you need to use it basically like this. So it works like a fixture and you have the, the schema par parameterized uh, decorator. And then you have the case here, you run the case.call uh, and uh, then you can validate the response. This actually just uh, does the same thing that the uh, internal one does to check that your status codes never go beyond 500, but it's great to just show how easy it can be to work with it, to extend it using PyTest. And here we use it from a URI, but you can use it with, uh, with importing as well. There's more information about that in the documentation. So quickly, stateful testing. I see that my time is running out, so I will do this quickly. Uh, so it's shown to enhance uh, detection. Basically, as I said before, you can use the objects you created to run further tests against. So you reach deeper into your code base. You find those more tricky things. And it's still optional. It's not done by default. It doesn't work with the old Swagger extension of the uh, Swagger implementation out of the box because it doesn't support links and it requires links. But there's a X links extension you can use and then, then it works. But you have to define this yourself. 
Uh, and it can look something like this. So here you can see post to users and gets the same user using the user ID, it patches it, uh, patches it again, gets it, patches it, and so on. Uh, so the future then, well, we need more help to grow. The documentation needs to be more improved, more people talking about it like I'm doing here today. Uh, GraphQL support will be really nice when it's more mature. Uh, schema standard uh, should be agnostic, so further ahead it shouldn't be limited to Swagger and uh, OpenAPI 2 and 3. Uh, OpenAPI 3.1 is coming, so support for that will probably not be too hard, but it should be working as well with the older versions. Uh, faster test generation is being worked on. Uh, we want to grow the community and of course, uh, yeah. So concluding, spend less time writing tests, cover more, let your computer do much of the heavy lifting, gain, deep, gain deeper confidence in your services. More things are coming, it's actively developed, a growing community and you should try it out. So if you have any further questions, you may ask them now or later in uh, either on Twitter or in the Discord or wherever you can find me. I will talk more about schema thesis in your Python later this month. I have a hypothesis course in the works. You can sign up, uh, pre-sign up via the link here. I also have a previous hypothesis uh, talk if you want to learn more about uh, property-based testing on YouTube. And here are some other links as well if you want to contact me or if you want to see more information about what I talked about today. So thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. So, um, or two questions. First question, I did not really get it. Do you need to set up your database before or does the uh, endpoints get tested in a specific order? Uh, I mean, it depends uh, on how you mean because you don't really need a database. It's going to use your schema to generate data. And if you use the stateful testing, it will reuse your objects. So if it creates an object, it will later try to retrieve the same object, patch the same object, delete the same object. But you should probably uh, you should probably be ready to wipe your database afterwards because it's gonna hit your endpoints a lot and it's gonna create a lot of trash data. So maybe not run it against your production database. Ah, okay. So so to uh, so it will start with for say all post requests and then it will or do you have to specify this order? Because sometimes a get uh, request is if you use Depends links in it. in your uh, if you use links in your schema, then it will handle it for that. But yeah. uh, otherwise, uh, it will use basically the order you saw in the demo here. So you see, it does the post, it does the get, it does the delete, okay. it gets. So yeah, uh, oh, it should nice. be able to. Uh, to handle most cases, but sometimes you may want to customize the behavior and then you have the hooks and you have the PyTest integration. So uh, when the CLI isn't enough, there is ways to customize it further. I have also another question. I don't know if there are any other questions, but okay, I, I will continue. <laughs> I have another question. Is there something like, I don't know if it's possible, but something like a coverage. So if I have specified all my endpoints, for example, or something like this, I, if I understand it correctly, it's independent of Flask or something like this. So I mean, it's maybe when, hard you used, to uh, do when you use the PyTest uh, version and you use it imported, I haven't tried it, but it should work with coverage.py out of the box, I think, because it's using PyTest, it's using hypothesis behind the scenes. So it should be basically like your normal tests. Okay, nice. Thank you. Ah, nice no talk. Problem. Nice uh, just uh, just one quick question. Maybe, maybe yeah. it doesn't make, make much sense, but I saw in the code for a for very nice talk, by the way. And in a very interesting project. Um, 
for you to get the open API spec on your example, you are hitting a, a real server, right? You are not constrained by that, right? Yeah, exactly. That's uh, why I talked about the whiskey and the ASCII interface as well. So you can run towards a real server, uh, like we did when we saw the log here, but now the server is turned off. And mm -hmm. when I run the test imported here, it uses the import, uh, uh, the import uh, path instead and imports the app directly. That was nice. So Great. that right. way you don't need to run a real server. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, thanks. So any more questions? Um, I think we do not have any more questions. And we're almost done. I think that will be it, Mr. Alexander. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And it's been a great conference. Uh, very fun to uh, be a uh, speaker and very fun to watch all the great speakers before me and Thank you. the last ones will be interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you.